Hi, hello, how are you? And welcome back to this edition of Bogart on Movies, aired right here in Palm Beach County on WXEL-TV. Of course, you can also find us on WXEL.org and just click the YouTube Facebook page and you'll get all the great shows produced right here on WXEL. This week we have a couple of movies that got a lot of hype. In our classic and Steve's Real Pick segments, we'll look at two of my favorite films. We'll check out Carla's Campy Picks and answer your emails. So, without further ado, the first movie we'll check out is the ensemble comedy starring Robert De Niro, Diane Keaton, Susan Sarandon, and others. The Big Wedding. Hello? Did you insist? Oh, Donnie. Mm. Oh, Hi. Hey, my ex-wife is here. Everyone loves a wedding, except the Griffins. Piece of wedding advice, kid. Stay single as long as you can. Because they're better at divorce. It's a joke. Oh, right. I forgot you haven't laughed since the 60s. Yeah, not since I married you. Yeah, well, oh. promise to never do that again. Is Miss O'Connor's virginity still intact? Excuse me, sir? Father Moynihan's just fine, sir. No. His mother is very much a Catholic. We just found out that she's coming to the wedding. She is. Oh, God. To survive the big day... Al's mother is under the impression that divorce is a great big fat sin. All they have to do... I guess we're going to hell, then. In God's good time, my son. I'm kidding. ...is to survive each other. Just pretend to be married for the weekend. What's the big deal? <laughs> oh, God. If those two are still married, what does that make me? My concubine? What the hell did I do? Why don't you ask your wife? Guys! What? What are you doing? Estos son mis otros papas, Don y Ellie Griffin. Um, Estro, casa... Me casa, whatever. This is gonna go great. This is basically a remake of the 2006 French movie, Mon Frère et Marie, which loosely translated means My Brother is Married. It's about a divorced couple, De Niro and Keaton, who were forced to pretend they're still married to placate the mother of the groom, who is their son, much to the chagrin of De Niro's current girlfriend, played by Sarandon. Funny stuff, right? And eh, not so much. Would somebody just please punch me in the face again? Because I don't know, what are we talking about? Oh, I... Uh... But, but, wait, well, wait a second. Well, it was, it was like a... She cheated on you first. <gasps> What? What? Why? What do you mean, why? What's her up in? How could you? I was really very unhappy at that time. What about me? Well, I don't really care about you. I know you don't. Listen, I don't know what to say. It was practically an accident. It was a long time ago, it was. And now you all have a wedding to go to. I'm going to call the movers. God! I feel so used. I love Cambodia. And it's perfectly safe. I know, because... I lived there for three months. Mom found herself in Asia. What? Oh. Hey. <laughs> Sir. What I miss. Mom, don't you know um, Tantra? Is that how you say it? You had a nine hour orgasm once? <gasps> Seriously? <laughs> it's gross. Nine hours? Okay. Doesn't that hurt? Uh, that's the problem. A great, talented cast. You can add Katherine Heigl, so miscast, and Amanda Seyfried. She tries hard, but they're just giving nothing to work with at all. The jokes fall flat, there's no depth at all to the characters, the script is boring, and other than good work from Sarandon and a few laughs from Robin Williams, he can't help but be funny, I didn't even crack a smile. This one's a big yawner. I give it only one and a half out of five. Hey, director and writers, with that cast, you gotta do better. And now, remember last week when I told you about the see it on TV before it's in theaters moniker? I said then that it usually means you're gonna see a bad movie. Yet Shadow Dancer was a pleasant anomaly. So I thought I was on a roll and I tuned into a movie again not out in theaters yet. It's called The Number Station. And unfortunately, this one's going straight to video. One, zero. Eight, one, zero, five. Why am I 
position for you to look after. You and another team alternating shifts. You'll have a girl. Civilian, right? Yeah. She processes the code, broadcasts the code. Zero, zero, seven, three. You keep the station safe, you keep the code safe, whatever it takes. Just for fun, what would happen if I wasn't here on Monday? I'd have to make a phone call. You'd have to make a phone call. No fun. Station's been compromised. Standard protocol. Secure location. The movie is about CIA operative Emerson Kent, played by John Cusack, whose latest mission goes horribly wrong and who's then sent to something called a number station. There, he becomes friends with an operator named Catherine, and together they try and save the whole agency. I like Cusack a lot, but not in this. He's miscast as a morose black ops guy. He's not given any shot at using the offbeat kind of sarcastic humor he does so well. Uh, Malin Ackerman, who plays Catherine, is actually pretty good, but it's not enough. These two are supposed to carry the whole movie, and they just can't do it. Catherine, when you send a broadcast, you're sending out these numbers to the agents in the field to deliver specific assignments they cannot trust to normal communication lines. Do you know what that means? 15 broadcasts. 15 assignments. Unauthorized. Assassinations, bombings, could be anything. Murders. What does it say? I can't read that. Agents in the field uh, carry like one-time notebooks, like pads. Each page is a new cipher. When you broadcast something, the agent matches up the first set of numbers to the page in the notebook. Now he knows he's using this page and this page only to decode the message. When he's done, he destroys the page. I did not like this movie at all. It's tough to follow. There's no feeling little excitement, no humor at all. Add to that some pretty graphic violence, a so-so script, and basically one boring dark location, and you get a movie that looks like it was made on the cheap, and that gets it a one out of five. I still don't know whether I should even give it that much. Yuck. Next, we turn to another movie that's gotten a lot of Hollywood hype centers around Jim Grant, played by Robert Redford, who also directed the movie. Grant's a former member of the militant Vietnam-era group, The Weather Underground, and he's been on the run from the FBI for 30 years after a deadly bank robbery. But now he's been found out and goes on the lam and has to connect with his old Weather Underground buddies in the company you keep. Watch as Redford says goodbye to his daughter as the FBI closes in. Are you okay? Everyone is so mad at you. How about you? You mad at me? Where are you? I'm trying to get back to you as soon as I can. Got him. Just off I-94 near Gurney, Illinois. Okay, Send the coordinates to the field. I know it won't be long. Done. You have a full green light. Still tracking? Yep. He's cooked. Okay, send Bravo team down. Did you kill that man? Did I... Kill him. That man at the bank. Of course not. Then why'd you have to leave? I mean, one day soon you're going to understand everything. I promise. I don't want you to grow up and look back on what I did and feel bad ever. Okay? But now you're going to have to help me. you got to be strong. And then next time, you and I will go somewhere together. All right? Anywhere you like. Home would be fine. Ugh. Before I go on, I should say I'm not a big Robert Redford fan. I admire what he's done for the environment and for film in general, what with Sundance and all, but I think the movies he directs are boring, and his acting is just so-so. Sorry, Redford fans. And this is more of that. 
The movie does have a fine cast, Susan Sarandon, Julie Christie, she still looks great, she's 72. Terrence Howard, Stanley Tucci, cameos from Nick Nolte and Sam Elliott, they all try as best they can. And there's a standout performance by Shia LaBeouf as a young, hungry investigative reporter. So, you moved here this morning? Why do you care? I thought you were covering politics now. Well, I'm multi-talented. How come she was arrested here if she's been a Vermont housewife for 30 years? I have to ask her that. You know, it's funny you should mention it, Dee, because from what I hear, people give jailhouse interviews all the time. Who do you think you are, the New York Times? <laughs> you say New York Times like it's 1985 and you're still impressed. You're just a local beat reporter. I love it when you do that with your hair. This is a national news story. I think you should go home and tweet about it. I don't tweet. Right, you don't email either. Can I just see the case file? For old time's sake, please. Do you think as we hooked up in college, I'm gonna give you access to FBI wiretaps? Wiretaps? What wiretaps? This is why I don't talk to you. And we didn't just hook up in college, okay? I have to go. New sheriff in town? How can you tell? Well, that's how it usually goes, right? Big case like this, they usually bring in someone from out of town, grab all the glory. Of course, the local field office should at least get credit in the local paper. Why not go put a good word for you? I'm a very social guy. Billy Cusimano. Organic grocery guy? It didn't come from me. That's Anna Kendrick, by the way, Oscar nominated for her great performance in George Clooney's Up in the Air. LaBeouf was really, really good. This guy can flat out act. I'm not gonna go into the politics here, although after Boston, this doesn't seem the time to be talking about the idealism of domestic terrorism. But the movie was just so boring, I almost fell asleep. What was supposed to be exciting wasn't. What was supposed to be interesting wasn't. What was supposed to be historical wasn't. What was supposed to be a good movie wasn't. It only gets a one and a half from me. I need a nap. I'll be back in a moment with a look at a classic on Bogart on Movies. I think the American Masters that uh, Susan Lacey and Bob Trachtenberg did with me is, you know, is about 73% really good. Uh, the rest is in the crapper, but I hope they cut that out. I'm glad I'm doing this because this is really, really a pleasure to do anything for PBS except give them money. PBS is, a, is very strange. It's like people begging for sustenance. They're not going to get it anywhere else. 50% of every program they see will have commercials. And uh, the commercials will probably be better than the show. Comedy is you, you walk into an open sewer and die. That's comedy. What do I get? You know. So what makes me laugh is fat people slipping on banana peels and falling on their ass. And a modicum of wit. When I can see somebody's mind in action, you know. I like, I like bold comics. And you know, I have one question for you, just one. And it's embarrassing. Is there any money in it for me? <laughs> do I get paid anything at all for doing it? Ah. Uh, well, buy my box set anyway. Sunday night is drama night on PBS on an all new Call the Midwife. Something tells me your working day is over. <laughs> Something tells me yours isn't. I need an ambulance, please. Then on an all new masterpiece. That's the royal seal of approval, Harry. The dramatic season finale. <laughs> He's engaged, Miss Lardle. Of Mr. Selfridge. I'm most tender my resignation. Are you going to leave me? Sunday night is Drama Night, May 19th at 8, 7 Central, only on PBS. Now it's time for my classic pick, and I've got a movie for you that I absolutely loved. And it had one of my favorite acting performances ever. It's Burt Lancaster in 1960's Elmer Gantry. Elmer Gantry is an all-American boy. He's interested in money, Sex and religion. What the hell's the big idea? Elmer. You really think I'm going to sit still for a shakedown? Baby, how could I put this The old badger you? game, huh? Who's going to take the word of a five buck hooker you against Elmer good. Gantry? I only wanted to see you for. For what? Well, for. For what? What do you think will get you into God's own glorious heaven? This ace of spades? Your bank book, or this pledge to be a good Christian? 
I'd like to tear those holy wings off you, make a real woman out of you. I'd show you what heaven's like. No golden stairways or harp music or silvery clouds. Just ecstasy, coming and going. Sin, sin, sin. You're all sinners. You're all doomed to perdition. Lancaster was magnificent. He won an Oscar, as did co-star Shirley Jones. Yup, Shirley Partridge and the Partridge family. The stellar cast also included previous winners Gene Simmons and Dean Jagger and Arthur Kennedy, a five-time nominee who lost out to my father nine years earlier in 1951 for my father's Charlie Allnut in African Queen. The movie's about a charismatic, big-drinking, traveling salesman who stumbles on a revivalist show run by Gene Simmons, Sister Falconer, and they join up and become lovers. Then Gantry draws the attention of a big city reporter played by Kennedy and a former Gantry girlfriend, now a hooker, as I said, played by Shirley Jones. Gantry has a voice made for promises. Can he save anybody? Can he? <laughs> Can he? Anywhere, anytime. In the tent, standing up, laying down, or any other way. And he's got plenty of ways. Lulu, was you saved by him, Lulu, honey? Sister, I was saved by him way back in Schoenheim, Kansas. Love. Love is the morning and the evening star. And what is love? Not the carnal, but the divine love. Oh, he gave me special instructions back at the pulpit Christmas Eve. He got to howl and rip repent. And I got to moan and save me, save me. Shirley was just so good. And the film was directed by one of my father's great friends, the brilliant Richard Brooks, who was also a writer. My father loved writers. Brooks won an Oscar for the screenplay. He was also Bogey's director in Deadline USA. He's usually left out of the great director discussions, but let's see. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, Blackboard Jungle, not bad, I'd say, but the movie, it was Lancaster's. And before I'm through, I'm gonna give you all the hell in the Bible. And if you don't like it, you better fix it up with the Lord because the Lord put it there. Yeah. Listen to me, sinners. Listen to me, sinners. You can't pray to kingdom come and play bridge or poker. And mother, you can't say your psalms and look at God through the bottom of a beer mug now, can you? And you, brother, you can't go to church on Sunday and cheat at business on Monday. We're coming back to your God. We're coming back to the old time religion. As I said, this is one of my favorite performances by any actor. I was as enamored with Lancaster in this movie when I first saw it 40 years ago as I am now. And I urge you to watch it. Real entertainment, Hollywood style. Now it's time to dive into the Bogart on Movies mailbox. Jody writes, love your show and who you are. You talked about disgusting things in movies that are not needed to advance the story. I hate scenes of vomiting, the mandatory men's bathroom scenes, and a close-up toothbrush involving spitting out. I'm not a prude. I'm a child of the 60s. But this stuff is not necessary. Why do they do it? Jody, I'm no prude either, but I so agree with you. That stuff is disgusting and it's just not necessary. I have no idea why they continue to put it in movies. Maybe screenwriters think it's edgy. Maybe it's for shock value. Maybe it's one shocking thing they can show. Remember, for the most part, we're still not allowed to see full frontal males nude on screen and seldom females. Don't they know what we look like? Just wait until someone breaks the male sex organ barrier. Anyway, Phil in Boynton Beach writes, I know you were not around at the time, but did your parents tell you how they met? Was it on the set of To Have and Have Not? And was it love at first sight? Phil, thanks to the producer Leland Hayward and his wife Slim Keith, my mom was given the part of Marie Slim Browning in the movie To Have and Have Not. And that's where they met, when my mother was 19 and my dad was 44. Whoa. My mom told me it wasn't love at first sight at all from her perspective, although I'm sure my father was thinking of other things. Ha ha. In fact, she didn't like him that way at all in the beginning. He was an old man to her. 
Thankfully for me, he changed her mind. They were in love by the end of the movie, and here I am. You can email me, send me your comments, land questions to Steve Bogart at WXEL.org, and include your name and your hometown. The teens were tough years for most of us, but not as tough as the teenager in this 1958 mess had it. Before he became the man from Uncle, Robert Vaughn was the teenage caveman. Are all the men gathered? All the fools. Why do we hunt in a place where there are only a few dead trees and a few animals to give to the fire? When there's plenty there. There are shadows there, deep and cold, and dirt that eats men. And animals far more terrible than any you've seen. What lies beyond? Just as modern man reaches into outer space, primitive man searches beyond his horizons, finding new and terrifying creatures in his prehistoric world. Massive beasts, his simple weapons only anger. Killer dogs he had not yet learned to tame. His courage proves the teenage caveman all man, winning for him a woman's love. We could make a place to lie down on, space above the floor so the cold couldn't reach us as we slept. A love pure and passionate and pagan, strengthening his courage, his daring, his dreams. I came to give this earth to the clan. See the awe-inspiring beasts in a teenage caveman's world. See reptilian monsters locked into the death battle. Now it's time for my real hit, and I got a movie for you that was not only a bellwether for my generation and marks the first major role for one of my all-time favorite actors, Dustin Hoffman, but it also made generational icons of the already popular folk duo Simon and Garfunkel. The movie, of course, is 1967's The Graduate. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Listen, everybody, I want you all to be quiet. I've got Ben's college yearbook here, and I just want to read you some of the wonderful things about Ben. The point is, I don't love your wife, I love your daughter, sir. Are you going to Scarborough? ask you a question and then I'm going. From him? No. I want to know why you're here in Berkeley. Is it because I'm here? Well, look, I love you. Parsley, sweet rosemary and thyme. Will you marry me? Are we getting married tomorrow? Why don't you just drag me off if you want to marry me so much? You can't stop me from seeing her, Mrs. Robinson. I'll find her. Sorry we won't be able to invite you to the wedding, Benjamin, but the arrangements have been so rushed. Oh, what a great scene. The movie's about college grad Benjamin Braddock, who's seduced by an older woman and falls in love with her daughter. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Aren't you? Have you gotten to the room yet? I haven't, no. Do you want to? I'll get undressed now, is that all right? Sure. Shall I? I mean, shall I just stand here? I mean, I don't know what you want me to do. Why don't you watch? Oh, sure, thank you. 
Everything about this movie is superb. The acting, it's Hoffman's first big role, and it made him a superstar for everyone my age. It co-stars Anne Bancroft. If you can believe it, Doris Day, yes, Doris Day and Jane Fonda, they both turned down the part. Bancroft's luscious portrayal of Mrs. Robinson made her a sexual fantasy for every guy. Catherine Ross, wonderful as daughter Elaine, Elaine. Patty Duke, Sally Field, and Shirley MacLaine all turned that one down. All three of those actors got Oscar nominations. Also watch for cameos by Mike Farrell from MASH and Richard Dreyfuss. And then there's that incredible score, the Simon and Garfunkel soundtrack. It was so big that when the album, yes, album, was released in 1968, it pushed the Beatles, White Album, off the top of the charts. And the director, the truly brilliant, multi-Tony and multi-Oscar winner Mike Nichols, who won the directing Oscar for this movie. Here's a Nichols story. Paul Simon supposedly told Nichols he was working on a song about Mrs. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's wife, and Joe DiMaggio, but it really wasn't right for the movie. Simon played a few bars and Nichols told him to change Mrs. Roosevelt to Mrs. Robinson, and the rest is movie history. That's what separates the so-called wheat from the chaff. This is a movie for everyone. Do yourselves a favor and watch it with the kids. Become a kid again yourself. See you next week.